The Browns dropped some new helmets and face masks and a new logo to go along with it. So we're going to share that with you guys to start the show. And then we're going to react to Dane Brugler from the Athletics seven-round mock draft for the Browns. See who he had Andrew Barry selecting with Cleveland's six picks. But let's get started with the big news of the day. Yet again, the Browns are tweaking their logo slash helmet, but specifically the face mask as the white face mask returns. I love how the team tweeted out this picture of Nick Chubb rocking the face mask. I like to envision that they just showed up to the team facility this morning to do a little photo shoot. And Nick Chubb, who's been at like 5 a.m. every single day rehabbing, was just there. And they're like, Chubb, would you mind throwing on some shoulder pads and rocking the new helmet because you're the only one in this early working out. But the new white face masks are back. We've had a, a long history of the Browns uh, yo-yoing and ping-ponging with different colored face masks. I'm a fan of the white face mask. I think they look very sleek. I think they look very cool, look very fresh. Um, you can actually run through the Browns' history here of logos since it didn't really make sense for the old logo to stay since the face mask in that picture was black. But we can kind of go down memory lane here uh, well before my time, but we get some different variations of Brownie the Elf starting off in 1948 for a decade. Then a much more recognizable Brownie the Elf, I would say, from 59 to 69. Then I really question what the artistic mind was thinking in the 70s and early 80s. This is what we came up with as a society. Uh, you know what? It's actually not as bad as the next one. Um, wow, that... That is quite the uh, the refrigerator artwork right there. Uh, and then we get towards, you know, modern iterations of the Cleveland Browns uh, logo with the helmet. Uh, with some slight changes to the coloring of it from 2006 to 2014, you had the gray face mask, which was kind of in between white and now the current face or the previous face mask uh, as of like yesterday, which was what we had for eight seasons of the black face mask. And now the current logo represents the white face mask return. So there you have it. The uh, history of the Cleveland Browns logos with the different face mask colors and only this fan base. But let me know. Do you like the white face mask? Give me a yes. Give me a no. Or give me a I don't really care. And listen, I, I wouldn't blame you if that's your response. I love this fan base, though. I'll tell you that right now. Because I don't think any other fan base would really, uh, you know, give a shit at all if the team changed the face mask color to put it bluntly but the dog pound oh no you touch a single color on that jersey on that helmet or anywhere on that uniform and there will be pitchforks in Berea but everyone seems to be on the same front with the white face masks they're cool they're fresh they really make the jerseys and the helmet pop a little bit more so I'm a fan of the white face mask I don't think any other fan base gives much thought at all to the color of the face mask. Like, I think if you asked a Patriots fan, what color face mask do the Pats have? They'd probably sit there thinking, I've watched every single game for 10 years, and I don't think I've ever actually registered the color of the face mask. But Brown fans, don't miss a detail. Now, next up on the show, I want to run through the Athletics mock draft. What color is the Patriots? Is it, is it red? I, I don't, is it red? I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you what the Chargers is. No way I could land the Chargers one. I, maybe it's white. I don't know. All right. Uh, let's get into the Athletics mock draft here. So Dane Brugler, one of the best NFL draft insiders, dropped a seven-round mock draft for all 32 teams. And for the Browns at pick 54 in round two, he went defensive tackle out of LSU, Mason Smith. So let's get to know the big fella from Baton Rouge. Six foot five, 306 pounds. I want to stop you right there and say there are not a lot of 300 pound plus defensive tackles in this draft class especially ones that move as swiftly and quickly and elegantly as mason smith does so from a physical standpoint he's a great defensive tackle the ras score reflects that that's a relative athletic score to other players size and weight uh, 8.4 out of 0. He definitely checks that box. Which Andrew Barry has always prioritized, whether he wants to admit it or not. And he's a bit of a youngin' too, 21 years old. Now, unfortunately, the reason why he's not a shoe in for at least round 2, if not earlier, is he only has one year of experience, right? You can see his 2023 stats, but you take it back to his beginning career as the former 5-star recruit going to LSU, didn't have much of a role in 2021, his first year on campus, but that's perfectly fine. 
Not a lot of freshmen do. Then in 2022, he blows out his ACL in the first game of the season, doesn't record a single stat, misses the rest of the year. And then 2023, he really gets his first opportunity to be a starter on this team. And I think he played very well while still kind of learning the position a little bit, right? He doesn't have a ton of experience after high school. So there's some boober bust potential to be had with Mason Smith. From a physical standpoint, he's great. From a production standpoint, there is a lot of unknown to be said. Now here's what Dane Brugler wrote in his beast write-up for Smith. Smith is a traits-based prospect with his size, movement skills, and pop-it contact. But his inexperience is evident on tape with his inconsistent technique, block recognition, and rush plan. NFL teams covet six foot five, 300-pound athletes on the defensive line, and those types are in short supply in this draft class, which will only boost Smith's draft projection. And he gave him a second to third round grade with a number 64 overall assignment. Andrew Barry could very well reach on Mason Smith, where if the NFL draft experts and gurus, you know what I'm talking about, deem he's a third round guy, Andrew Barry may look at six foot five, 300 pounds that moves like a six foot one, 300 or 250 pound player and think just that raw potential right there is just way too good to pass on, especially because. He doesn't need the 54th overall pick to be an impact player in 2024. He can take a more raw product that needs a year of coaching and development because look at Cleveland's defensive line. They don't need Mason Smith to come into training camp and compete for a starting job. Like They've got their rotation pretty much locked up. Dalvin Tomlinson, Shelby Harris, Quinton Jefferson, Maurice Hurst. And I haven't even gotten to third round pick from 2023 Siaka Ika. So there's a lot of ways where a developmental pick could make sense on the defensive line. And then you toss in the fact that Jim Schwartz with a six foot five, 300 pound monster that moves like a wide receiver. Don't you think with a year of coaching and getting the technique and the fundamentals down, he can take that mold and create the next uh, beautiful sculpture we've seen? I just think that's something Andrew Barry would be uh, very tempted by. So if it was Mason Smith, how would you grade the draft pick? A, B, C, D, or F? You could go at a different position, which could have a bigger impact in 2024. Linebacker, running back, uh, maybe wide receiver, although I think that room's kind of locked up. Offensive tackle, if one of Conklin, Wills, or Jones doesn't recover as quickly as you'd like from their three knee surgeries. But I think Mason Smith, on a trait standpoint, if they feel like Jim Schwartz can coach him up to be a great defensive tackle, this could be a home run pick for the Browns. All right, let's move on to round number three, pick 85, where Brugler went offensive tackle out of Yale. It is Karan Amaganji, and I'm going to expand on this pick and tell you all about the Yale Bulldog in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you all about our sponsor today, which is Mando. Baseball fans, we know that we don't like foul balls. And you know the kind I'm talking about. No matter how hard you scrub them in the shower, they are still smelling like last week's nacho cheese. Well, ditch the soap and step up to the plate with Mando, whole body deodorant. Developed by a doctor, this game-changing formula is safe for your entire body and knocks out odor like a champ. New customers can also get $5 off a starter pack at shopmando.com with promo code CHAT. Now, I walk to work when the weather gets nice. It's about a 25-ish minute walk, and sometimes that means I come into the office with a sweat going already, and you don't want to be a smelly dude all day long, but with Mando at my desk, I can kick that odor to the curb. So make sure you head on over to shopmando.com and use code CHAT to get $5 off the starter pack. That equates to over 40% off. You also will get solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice like mini body wash and deodorant wipes along with free shipping. So use that promo code CHAT, C-H-A-T, at shopmando.com to get $5 off their awesome starter pack. I put all that information for you guys in the comments and description of today's video. Now let's get back to our mock draft from Brugler and talk about Karan 
Amaganji. And I even put the phonetic spelling in there because I'm tired of mispronouncing this guy's name. So some insiders believe like this is your sleeper, where if you were able to talk to Mel Kuyper and say, give me a sleeper for day two or day three of the draft, this name keeps popping up. Now, he started at left tackle the last two seasons after beginning his collegiate career at Yale at guard. In fact, he's kind of a late bloomer in the football world. He didn't start playing football until much later in his life, and he's got a very fascinating life path to how he got to where he is at today. Now, unfortunately, he suffered a torn quad early in 2023, so there's not a whole lot of 2023 tape, but the 2022 tape is very impressive, and the size and athleticism definitely stand out. It's hard to get recognized when you play at Yale or an Ivy League school. So when you do, it's in large part because of your physical attributes. It's not so much of the production because when you go up against Cornell DBs, I mean, you're playing against future, you know, Sachs accountants. So no one's going to really give you a whole lot of credit. But for Karan Amaganji, he has definitely picked up uh, a lot of attention in this pre-draft process. Here's what Brugge had to say. Amaganji is a raw product who needs technical and strength work before he sees a live NFL reps. But his physical ingredients and competitive drive are the foundational elements that pro coaches want to develop. He projects as a backup left tackle as a rookie who has all the tools to gradually develop into an NFL starter. For me, in round three, I think this is a solid developmental pick. Personally, I'm not over the moon about Amaganji. I just think going back-to-back developmental picks it kind of sets you up for what could be a really tough draft if the blossom in the spring never comes for either player. But for the Browns, they can be very patient at offensive tackle. They don't need to get a guy who is a surefire, ready-to-roll-out player. They only need to get a guy who can maybe step in in 2025 when they potentially move on from Jed Wills or Jack Conklin. So if they feel like, hey, the ceiling for Amaganji is way higher than some other players, but he's just not anywhere near there right now, that's perfectly fine for them. They don't need him to be there right now. They can let him go into training camp and get some coaching. Now, I will add, not having Brian Callahan anymore is a little bit of a knock for the belief of we can develop any offensive tackle. Fast forward to round five, pick 156, with no fourth rounder, the Browns wait quite a bit, and then they land USC wide receiver Taj Washington. Five foot nine, 174 pounds. Now, don't look at the size and think the guy's a speed demon. Uh, he's got some good quickness and some athletic traits to his game, but, you know, four, five, two, 40 yard dash, it's not the slowest we've seen, but that's not very far off from like what Cedric Tillman ran, for example. Now, the pro I've got for him is he's a big play machine, though. Five receptions for 50 plus yards last year. That was the best in the Pac 12. Having Caleb Williams as your quarterback could help with that, but he only had one drop, so he was able to, you know, live up to his side of the bargain. Uh, The con I've got, though, is teams are likely going to look past Washington because of that frame. 5'9", 174 pounds. Man, some physical, bigger NFL DBs will be easily able to reroute Washington, and he doesn't have an extensive route tree. He exclusively played out of the slot last year at USC. And I don't, I'm not really sold on the Browns looking for a slot receiver after trading for Jerry Judy. Now, last year for the Trojans, over 1,000 yards, he averaged 18 yards of receptions, 18 yards of reception and eight touchdowns. Listen, when I put on the tape for Taj, like, it says it's a very different story than what you see on paper. Sure, five foot nine, 170 pounds. The frame isn't built to last in the NFL. But when you watch him play, you get a different sense. So I think Taj for a day three pick could be a really nice sleeper. Here's what Brugler wrote on him. Washington's size will immediately turn off some teams, but his competitive focus and playmaking instincts are the make-it qualities evaluators desire at the receiver position. He will push for slot and special team snaps during his rookie season. Let's get on to the rest of day three now. In round six, the Browns go linebacker out of Notre Dame, JT Bertrand. So let's get to know the Fighting Irish middle linebacker. Six foot, 235 pounds. So a little bit on the smaller end. 
Uh, three-year starter for the Fighting Irish. He also led Notre Dame in tackles all three seasons, which I think is extremely impressive. He's also in a very rare club of being a multi-year captain for Notre Dame. I mean, you know that school's a little bit of a cult, Rudy, all that good stuff, but they really value their leadership, and he was someone that the coaching staff really trusted. Now, physically, he does not stand out very much. He doesn't have a horse trait that I like to reference here that Andrew Barry looks for. But then again, in round six, you don't find a ton of those guys anymore. In day three of the draft, personally, what I'm looking for in prospects is special teams abilities, because that is a third of the game. And sure, you might only think about what they can do for you on offense or defense, but a lot of these guys have to work their way up there. And a good way to get those minutes on offense or defense is to impress the coaching staff on special teams. So can he play special teams? And also, just the overall character and makeup of the person. When you're a 6th or 7th round draft pick, the odds are stacked against you. Whether coaching staffs want to admit it or not, first, second, third round players, they get a little bit of a longer runway. They get a little bit more of a benefit of the doubt, okay? Day 3 guys, they know they are coming in with an uphill battle ahead of them. So I'm looking for guys that have great character, have great competitiveness to them, work ethic, and they're going to push themselves to overcome those challenges. Whereas players with maybe not that same type of character, but just kind of coasted off their talent, well, when you get to the NFL, you can't win off talent alone. So I want to find guys that can have that extra gear in them. And I think uh, JD is one of those players. Uh, here's what Brugler had to say on him. Bertrand is sawed off with only adequate range and coverage, but he processes well with play recognition skills and competitive makeup that will endear him to NFL coaches. He projects as a backup linebacker with rotational value in the NFL. To conclude the mock draft, let's look at the seventh round picks where first up is South Dakota State running back Isaiah Davis, the FCS rushing leader last year. And then at pick 243, it is Javon Cohen from Miami. So, uh, Javon Cohen, I beg your pardon, from Miami. Let's talk about Davis briefly first. So, the Jack Rabbit had 236 carries for 1,500 plus yards and nearly averaged seven yards a pop in 19 total touchdowns. Now, I don't want you to fall into the trap of South Dakota State, Jack Rabbits. He must be super duper fast. That's actually not Davis's game. He, he's not a jackrabbit. He's not one of the fastest backs in this draft class. Don't look at him like how we kind of looked at Pierre Strong Jr. coming out. He's a bit of more of a bruising type tackle. Uh, running back, I beg your pardon. Um, so to recap the mock draft here, Mason Smith first in round number two, then Karan Amaganji, then Taj Washington, then J.D. Bertrand, then Isaiah Davis, and then Javon Cohen, who... I think can serve as a uh, good like just depth piece on the interior offensive line. And if the Browns are thinking about moving on from either Teller or Petonio sometime in the future because of their contracts, not the worst idea in the world to try and throw a dart in round number seven at that same position. So before we get on out of here, if you are ready for the NFL draft, type me in the comment section below. Let me know if you are just fired up for the draft to get here and you cannot wait. Let's wrap up the show by picking a card. I got producer Matthew McCullough hanging out with me today. Big Tex, what card do you want to go with, bud? Let's go with seven of diamonds. Seven of diamonds. I don't hate it. I don't hate it, especially because seven rounds and you're looking I like your number more than mine already. Um, I'm going to go with the Jack of Clubs. I don't know why, but I'm feeling it. Six of spades. Six of spades. All right. I'll let you guys get on out of here. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.